Welcome to Mathematics for Machine Learning. The topic of today's lecture is the Moore-Penrose pseudo-inverse. So we're going back to linear algebra here for a short moment. We will use the Moore-Penrose pseudo-inverse in order to answer an important question that arises in linear regression, and that is namely, what is the closest projection that we can do from an arbitrary point onto the column space of a linear operator. I think things will get clearer if we go into it. So let's do that right now. So we're starting out by a matrix A that defines a linear map. So it's a function that goes from Rn to Rm. Here we have on the one side Rn, on the right side Rm. In addition to A, this linear map, we are also given a vector B. It's a vector B element R. M. So we are here on the right side, but we're not necessarily on the column space or the null space of a transpose. And what we're looking for is some vector x that if we multiply it by a, we end up as close as possible to b. So what we will do is we'll multiply this x by a. So we're computing a x, which we can also call b hat. And this b hat should be as close as possible to b. So we will never get exactly here because b might be outside the column space and because we're computing a times x, we are basically building a combination of the columns of A, right? I mean, it's basically the sum over the entries in x, so over the xi's, times the corresponding column. So it's a weighted sum of the columns. Right? And if this vector b here is not a weighted sum of the columns, we can never reach it. But we can say, okay, well, we're looking for an x that gets us as close as possible in terms of the norm of this difference vector, which we call epsilon. Now let's formalize this a little bit. Well, epsilon is the difference between b, the vector that we're interested in, and the result of a multiplied by our unknown x. And what we are trying to do is we want to find the x that minimizes the norm of epsilon. This is equivalent to saying, well, we're looking for the minimum x of this norm squared. And let's uh, plug in already our formula for epsilon. So it's the minimum of b minus a x squared. Of course, we can always put constant here, but we'll still have the same minimum. Or if we write down basically this norm, we get this form here, where, which is the dot product of this vector epsilon, so b minus a x times itself. So that's building basically the sum of squares, which is the square of the Euclidean norm then we're minimizing with respect to x. Now in our introduction to calculus, so in our first calculus lecture, we have already um, talked about an important tool to solve this, namely the gradient. What we'll do is we will compute the gradient of this sum of squares here, 
and set it to zero in order to find the minimum of this function. So the gradient of b minus ax transpose b minus ax equals to a transpose b minus ax. And if we say that a transpose b minus ax, the gradient should be 0. So set it to 0. And we end up at either a minimum or a maximum. In this case, it's actually a minimum. Um, equivalently, we can say that a transpose b should be equal to a transpose a x. And what we're interested in is only a solution for x. So we still have to get rid of this a transpose a here. So let's make the assumption that a transpose a is invertible, then we can actually get rid of it. We can just multiply from the left both of these expressions with a transpose a inverse. So if a transpose a is invertible, then we can solve it. So we find our optimal vector x. So this x here equals a transpose a inverse a transpose b. Now this a transpose a inverse a transpose is also known as the so-called Moore Penrow pseudo inverse. Of the matrix A. Now we can answer an additional question. What is actually this B hat here? We even so we have a closed form for our optimal X, which is A transpose A inverse a transpose b, so the pseudo inverse, times b. And we know that b hat, this b hat here is a times this vector. So we can actually also get a direct closed form for our projection. Yeah, so we can say that this here, this b hat, equals a times a transpose a inverse a transpose b. And actually what we have now found is a matrix which is a symmetric matrix. So it's a matrix that is of size n times n because it's a because this b hat here is again a linear projection of B onto the column space of A. So this matrix H here, which is A times the pseudo inverse, so A times A transpose A inverse, A transpose is a projector that goes from Rm to the column space or the range of A. So goes to the range of A. So we can take now, if we have this matrix here, once we have computed it, we could take an arbitrary vector here from Rm, say we take this vector, we multiply it by h, 
and then go, so let's call this, for example, C, you would get C hat, which is the projection, so it's the least squares projection of C on to the column space of A. What is this pseudo -infer inverse? We have seen how we can compute it for the case where A transpose A is invertible. But let's have a little closer look at it. The Moore-Penrose pseudo inverse is a matrix that we denote by a dagger. And it's a matrix that has the following properties. So A itself is not invertible because it's an N by M matrix. Only square matrix, if they are full rank, are invertible. So N by M matrices, if they they're not square, they are not invertible by itself, but we can build this pseudo inverse that we call a dagger. And the first property is that if we multiply these pseudo inverse from both the left and the right with a, then we get a back. S uh, similarly, if we take a and multiply a from both left and the right with a pseudo inverse, we get a dagger back. So we get from A to A dagger, we get from A dagger to A, and it is unique. Note that for the invertible case, actually, the inverse would be the pseudo inverse. It's unique and it's easy to verify that if, so say, um, B invertible, then B inverse is the pseudo inverse because B times B inverse B, well, this is the identity here, equals B, and similarly B inverse B, B inverse, well, this is again the identity, equals to B inverse. So these two properties hold for the invertible case. So, so if B is invertible, then B dagger equals B inverse. But in general, we cannot say that this matrix is invertible because it's not necessarily square. So, so of course, if it's invertible, it's also square, right? So N equals M and it's full rank. Now we have said that in case A transpose A is invertible, that A transpose A inverse A transpose is the pseudo inverse. So let's verify this. So how do we verify this? Again, by proving these two properties, one and two. So A times A dagger, let's plug it directly in. A transpose A inverse A transpose times A. What is that? Well, here we have A transpose A, here we have A transpose A inverse. So this becomes the identity and we're left with A. So property one holds. Similarly for property two, we have A dagger. So we're starting out with A transpose A inverse, A transpose, that's our A dagger. Then we have A, and then we have A dagger again, so A transpose A inverse A transpose and the result of that should be A dagger. So let's verify this. Well, we immediately see that uh, here we have A transpose A inverse, here we have A transpose A, so that cancels and what we're left with is A transpose A 
inverse a transpose. So these one and two hold. Now what happens if a transpose a is not invertible? Well, then a a transpose may be invertible. So let's look at the case that where a a transpose is invertible. In this case, the pseudo inverse is a, a transpose inverse, but we need to multiply this from the right, from sorry, from the left with a transpose. So let's verify that properties one and two hold. Let's look at one first, A times this matrix here. So we have A transpose, A, A transpose inverse times A. The result of it should be A. And you see that because here we have the identity because these two cancel. One holds, two similarly, a transpose, a, a transpose inverse times a times this pseudo inverse, which is a transpose, a, a transpose inverse equals, well, Again, this matrix cancels with this matrix, and what we're left with is A transpose times A, A transpose inverse, which is again our pseudo inverse. So for our M times N matrix A, we have shown that if A transpose A is invertible, which is usually the case if M is larger than N and the rank of the matrix is N, a transpose A inverse times A transpose is a pseudo inverse. And for the case where M, the M by M matrix A A transpose is invertible, which is usually the case if M is smaller than N and the rank is equal to M, then the pseudo inverse is A transpose A A transpose inverse. So what for the case if the rank of A is R, which is smaller than both M and N. In this case, we so far don't have a more Penrose pseudo inverse. Can we still get one? And the answer is yes, and I will show you um, soon. But let's first look again at the singular value decomposition of A. So the singular value decomposition we said provides us the basis for these four important subspaces. So we have our decomposition of A, so A equals U sigma V transpose, so A element R M cross N. So U is an M by M orthogonal matrix of left singular vectors, V is an n by n matrix of right singular vectors, then sigma is a diagonal matrix that is size m by n that has the singular values on the diagonal and remember that the first R of these singular values where R is the rank of A, are positive, and the remaining diagonal entries are zero. So then the first R of the singular vectors, of the right singular vectors, so V1 through VR, R is the rank of A, form a basis of the row space, and 
v r plus 1 through v n form a basis of the null space of A and similarly u1 through ur where r is the space uh, is the rank of A form a basis of the column space of A and u r plus 1 through u n form the basis of the null space of A transpose. So this should be an M here. And if we look at our singular value decomposition, then we said that we can diagonalize A or equivalently we can write, well, we have A equals U sigma V transpose because these two matrices are orthogonal. We can multiply now this from the right with V, which means that V transpose V will cancel and we're left only with U sigma on the right. And here we have A times V. So we have the equality A V equals U times sigma. Remember that sigma is a diagonal matrix that has on the first sigma 1 through sigma r positive singular values and then zeros everywhere else. Thus, we can rewrite this multiplication u times sigma in terms of the first r columns of u. So a times v1 is equal to sigma 1 times u1. So we are now splitting up this matrix matrix product into a product of the matrix and the first column here is equal to the first singular value times the first column of the matrix u. And this gives us not just one equation, but r of these, because this needs to hold for all of these non-zero singular values. So av1 equals sigma1 times u1, av2 equals sigma2 times u2 up to avr equals sigma r times ur. And of course, because the remaining singular values, so the remaining diagonal entries of sigma are zero, a times vr plus one equals zero to a vn is still zero. So because everything above r, where r is the rank of this matrix, we can actually ignore this whole part here of sigma, which also means that we only need the first r columns of u and the first r columns of v in order to represent all of these equations. And equivalently, we can actually reduce this singular value decomposition, this full singular value decomposition, which uses the whole m by m matrix u, so all m left singular vectors, all the singular values, where the first r are positive and the remaining ones are zero, and the whole n single, right singular vectors v can reduce this and rewrite this using only the first r of the columns of u, the first r columns of v, and the first r singular values, because the remaining here is just zero. So this matrix product here can be decomposed in these outer products of the first singular vector u1 with the first right singular vector v1 transpose times the first singular value plus sigma2 times u2 v2 transpose up to sigma r times ur vr transpose. Of course, we could write now also sigma 
r plus 1 times u r plus 1 v r plus 1 transpose and so on. But because the remaining sigmas are all equal to 0, we can just ignore them. Yeah? Which also means that we can rewrite the singular value decomposition using only the first r left singular vectors and only the first r right singular vectors. So we are building these matrices vr, which is, this is v, then vr is this part here, which is the first r columns of v, and ur, this is the matrix of right singular vectors u, then ur is the first r singular vectors of u, so the first r columns, and sigma r is only this part here. So where we have r to r, so it's an r by r diagonal matrix that holds on the diagonal the first r positive singular values. So let's quickly summarize the reduced rank singular value decomposition. So if a equals u sigma v transpose, where a is a rank r matrix, then this singular value decomposition is equal to well, the matrix u, which has the complete set of n left singular vectors times the matrix sigma, which is the diagonal matrix that holds on the diagonal the singular values where only r of these are positive, so sigma 1 through sigma r are larger to 0, and the remaining ones are equal to 0, and v, the matrix of right singular vectors that holds the full set of n right singular vectors as columns. And then we transpose this matrix v to get u sigma v transpose. And because this part here is 0, we can rewrite a using the reduced form of the singular value decomposition, which is given by our matrix ur that holds only the first r columns. So this part here is ur with the first r columns of u. Then this matrix here, which is sigma r, which is a diagonal matrix, which is r times r, and has the r singular values that are larger than 0 on the diagonal, and the matrix vr, which is given by the first r columns of v, this is vr here, and this is equal to the full singular value decomposition. So the reduced rank singular value decomposition is equal to the full singular value decomposition. Now in the following, we go back to the pseudo-inverse. So we say that we didn't have a pseudo-inverse for the case where the rank r is smaller than either m or n. And I'll tell you that actually using the reduced rank sigma r, we can get a pseudo-inverse. And this pseudo-inverse is equal to v, so the right matrix of right singular vectors of A times a matrix that we call sigma dagger, and I'll define it in a moment, times U transpose the left singular vectors transpose. And sigma dagger we define as follows. Sigma dagger is a matrix that has the same dimensions as sigma transpose. That will again be a blocked matrix that has 
four blocks. Namely, it will take sigma r inverse on the top left and the remaining will be zero. Why can I safely assume that sigma r is invertible? Because it's a r by r diagonal matrix that has only positive values on the diagonal. So sigma r inverse is also a diagonal matrix that has on each diagonal element one divided by the corresponding sigma i i or i equals one to r. Now I construct this matrix and say that it's a pseudo inverse. Now what do we need to do in order to show that it's a pseudo inverse? We need to show the two properties. So we need to show on the one side that a a dagger let's call this one times a equals a and on the other side that a dagger a a dagger equals a dagger. Okay, let's start out with the first one and we'll basically work with this form of a dagger. and the singular value decomposition of A. So we replace A by U sigma V transpose. Then we plug in our A dagger, which is V times sigma dagger times U transpose times the singular value decomposition of A, which is U sigma V transpose. Now because v and u are orthogonal, this simplifies, this becomes u times sigma, sigma dagger times sigma v transpose. Now what is sigma, sigma dagger times sigma? Well, all of these three are diagonal matrices, but as we'll see, they all are diagonal matrix. So the matrix product will actually be a matrix that is again blocked and will have well, zeros here. So sigma, sigma dagger times sigma equals the following matrix. Here we have sigma 1 squared, because we have sigma twice here, divided by sigma 1 from sigma dagger up to sigma r squared divided by sigma r, which means that one of the sigmas on the diagonal cancels. So we are left with sigma 1 through sigma r on the diagonal. So this equals to u sigma v transpose, the singular value decomposition of a, which equals a. So the first one goes through. And similarly, the second one will also go through. So this is equivalent to saying that v sigma dagger u transpose times the singular value decomposition of a, which is u sigma v transpose times our definition of a dagger, which is V sigma dagger U transpose. And again, this cancels, this cancels and equals V times sigma dagger, sigma times sigma dagger times U transpose, which similarly to this term here becomes sigma dagger. So it's V sigma dagger times U transpose equals our A dagger definition. So we have proven these two properties and we have found a pseudo inverse for an arbitrary matrix A. So we have not made any assumptions about the rank as we have done before. And with this reduced rank singular value decomposition and a how we can use the reduced rank singular value decomposition to come up with a pseudo inverse of an arbitrary matrix A. I want to quit for the day and say thank you and goodbye.
See you next time. Bye-bye.